Hello and welcome to episode 6 of season 4 of the Dark Money Files in which we shine a light into a murky world. I am Ray Blake and with me is my co-host friend and business partner Graham Barrow. Hello Graham. Hello Ray. Uh, well, Graham, I know we were anticipating that the Swede Bank report would make for what you recently referred to on the podcast as ugly reading, uh, but I'm not sure we thought it would be quite so ugly. No, Ray, hence this special episode. And for those who have other things on their mind at the moment... Are there any other major news stories around at the moment, Ray? Well, there's a bit of a virus doing the rounds, Graham. Oh, that one. Yeah. Um, Shall we try and keep this reasonably light-hearted and maybe not talk about COVID-19? Well, we can certainly avoid COVID-19 in every respect and and put to one side our existential angst for a while. Um, Mm. But I'm not sure this will be particularly light-hearted anyway. Well, no. Reading through the executive summary, I see exactly what you mean. We should go back to the beginning, though. Uh, Following revelations on Swedish TV last year, Swedbank commissioned a report into their Baltic banking operations to determine just how exposed they were to suspicious money flows. And the initial somewhat limited report issued fairly quickly after that announcement by Forensic Risk Alliance was covered by us in a previous special episode back in March 2019. Mm, Yes, and at the time we thought it was very limited. Yeah, unlike the Clifford Chance report just released. I never thought I'd say this, Graham, but it's almost over-engineered. Well, it's certainly very thorough, Ray. Um, To explain, Clifford Chance were appointed by Swedbank to identify historical deficiencies. And it's interesting that right at the outset, there's no attempt to describe them as alleged or potential deficiencies. No, the report makes clear that alongside the allegations in the TV programme and the pending investigations by a host of regulators, the bank had already come to the conclusion that from the existing reviews they had conducted internally, there were historical deficiencies. They just weren't sure of the totality of them. They certainly know more now. They do. Let's just explain a bit more about the material that Clifford Chance, with the assistance of FTI Consulting's forensic help, considered. Uh, For a start, they analysed several billion transactions, 160 million customer records, over 38 terabytes of electronic and scanned data from internal files, which included emails, audit reports, KYC files, management committee meetings and other supporting materials. Hmm, from which I think it's reasonable to guess that this wasn't wholly a manual review. Well, no. Uh, This was done primarily using targeted search terms to throw up items of interest that warranted closer analysis. However, Clifford Chance did conduct nearly 100 interviews with 81 individuals. Um, And just doing a quick sum in my head, because I can do that, Mm. um, Mm. that suggests that some were interviewed more than once? Wow, right. (laughs) Lightning. Um, yes. It's a talent, but um, I wear it lightly. You, 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 that's, <laughs> I'm just in awe. <laughs> um, and, and those interviews range from current and former employees right up to board members, also current and former, and even to external legal counsel. Mm, and it's also interesting that right from the outset of the report, Clifford Chance go out of their way to say that the new management board gave them unfettered access to all materials and sought at all times to ensure the preservation of potentially relevant documents and data. Yeah, in the circumstances they had precious little alternative, but fair play, they appear to have gone above and beyond to make this episode fully transparent. And if you care to dive into the details of the full report, which runs to well over 200 pages, the care they took with logging all of the data is extraordinary. Yes, if ever you wanted an insight into how to capture, normalise and record data from both structured and unstructured sources, and ensure that future researchers could be certain that it had survived without being tampered with in any way, the full report makes for really quite illuminating reading. Um, Including the use, according to our interpretation, of blockchain technology to ensure that, once added, the material could not be altered without it becoming very obvious. 
Yeah, it's an intriguing implementation of blockchain technology and one which I think we'll see more and more frequently. The main report even references the specific hash algorithm they used, uh, which was the SHA-256 standard, if anyone's interested. Well, I was, so thank you, (laughs) Ray. Um, The next part of the report, importantly, seeks to place the investigation into context with the rules and regulations that applied at the time. Yes, and not just the rules, but the way they were interpreted and applied by banks, particularly those that operated multi-jurisdictionally. It wouldn't be fair to judge behaviours from the past by the standards of today. No, although that does happen elsewhere in the world really rather far too often, I think. Indeed. It is okay to say that, with hindsight, certain things are perhaps morally questionable, um, but you can't hold people accountable for acting within the rules and regulations that applied at the time, even though we now think they were inadequate. Yes, which means that any criticisms arriving from the report relate to failings within the regime current at the time of the actions being investigated. Exactly. And Clifford Chance also make the point that they did not conclude that Swedbank engaged in money laundering or process transactions that constituted the proceeds of crime. OK, but Ray, that would be true of any investigation of any bank, frankly, anywhere. Mm. Um, it is explicit to all suspicious activity reports that the most a bank can do is identify transactions or behaviours that do not render themselves to a sensible conclusion. It means they fall outside of explainable events. But the bank cannot determine on its own whether a transaction was criminal. That is the job of the law enforcement agencies. That's absolutely right, Graham. Uh, I think that Clifford Chance just wanted to make it extremely clear that their report was not allocating legal jeopardy, um, but regulatory failings. And I suppose also noting that the bank wasn't money laundering on its own account. Well, true, true. (laughs) Um, But... OK, so what time period does the report cover, Ray? Well, effectively from 2007 to the date it was commissioned, uh, but primarily from 2007 to 2016. Uh, and one of the biggest bombshells comes right at the beginning. Go on. Well, apparently, Swedbank, which actively pursued non-resident high-risk customers... Uh, they call them HRNRs in the report, Mm. um, within its Baltic operations, uh, accepted new customers in 2016, which had recently been off-boarded by another bank in Estonia in 2015, following their decision to terminate its non-resident portfolio. Yeah, and while it doesn't say so explicitly, it looks like it took the opportunity following the end of the Danske Bank non-resident business in Estonia to grow its customer base. And as far as I understand, it pretty much admitted that at the Mm. press conference this morning. Mm -hmm. Now, we ought to say clearly the report does not name Danske and even assuming that is who they're talking about, it doesn't follow that every (coughs) high-risk non-resident account at Danske was involved in criminal activity Mm. and therefore, you know, they shouldn't have been offered facilities by another bank. Uh, No, but in the light of the rest of the report and the significant control failings all the way up to the management board, it doesn't look very clever in hindsight. Uh, No, and for many banks, it wouldn't have looked clever with foresight either, Ray. Well, I think it's a problem with sight, generally, (laughs) Um, whatever whatever lens you're looking through, Graham. Um, Mm. The first full paragraph at the top of page three of the executive summary uh, makes for quite cringeworthy reading. Actually, Ray, it is almost a perfect case study in how not to do things. I think if you're up to it, it is really worth reading that in full. OK, deep breath then. Um, It says, Although Swedbank Estonia created a special committee to review the onboarding and maintenance of HRNR customers, the investigation has identified that this committee approved high-risk customers without having complete documentation regarding the ultimate beneficial owners, UBOs, proof of source of funds or explanation of the legitimate business purpose of the customers, and did not address red flags that arose from the information that was provided. Some of the companies had complex and opaque ownership structures involving offshore entities organised in low-tax jurisdictions, as well as ownership through foreign trusts and similar vehicles for which the UBOs were difficult to verify. 
Swede Bank Estonia also accepted customers despite awareness amongst employees, including relationship managers, that the listed beneficial owners were not the actual UBOs, and in situations in which the prospective customer refused to provide verifiable beneficial ownership information. Lordy, lordy, lordy. Mm. Um, and it goes on to say, quotes, In addition, at Swede Bank Estonia, employees involved in the HRNR business kept certain information regarding the UBOs for some customers outside of Swede Bank's regular customer databases Oof. and retained the information in hard copy in a safe or locked drawer to assuage the customer's concerns that the true UBOs may become known to third parties. Oof. Swedbank Estonia employees also accepted customer corporate structures knowing that they were designed to conceal the true UBOs from home country tax authorities. Mm. Lastly, Swedbank Estonia employees also repeatedly overlooked or disregarded indications of potentially suspicious transactions. Some of these practices were also identified in the other Baltic subsidiaries. The AML deficiencies were not limited to the Baltic subsidiaries, as certain of the high-risk customers that banked primarily in the Baltics were also permitted to open and to maintain accounts with Swede Bank, LCNI, and Swedish banking. Cool. Wow. Um, yeah. Hmm. And there's no way that that behaviour is going to get past a regulator without significant fines and censure. And indeed, yesterday, Swede Bank were fined four billion Swedish crowns, which is about three hundred and thirty million pounds, or three hundred and eighty-three million dollars. Uh, a record for the jurisdiction, I believe, uh, by some margin. By, <laughs> by some margin. Yeah. Okay. Um, moving on, the report goes into some detail about the transactional analysis it performed on the HRNR clients in the Baltics. It looked at activity in all three Baltic countries: Estonia being the most active, followed by Latvia and then Lithuania. Yes, and it identifies between 2014 and 2019, so not across the Mm. entirety of the review period. Um, Outflows across all three countries amounting to 18.9 billion euro and inflows amounting to 17.8 billion euro. An awful lot of money. Um, And there's an interesting little sting in the tail for Lithuania right at the end of this passage. Um, uh, Yes. Do you want to explain... Uh, I will. Um, The report makes clear that there was a significant tailing off between 2014 and 2019 for both Swede Bank Latvia and Swede Bank Estonia. Uh, In Estonia, incoming payments decreased from a high mark of 9.9% of total incoming payments to just over 1%. And in Latvia, they fell from a high of 6.8% to just under 1%. However, in Lithuania, its high point, which admittedly was only 2.8%, was achieved in 2018 against the falling trend of the other two countries. Mm. But sadly, we don't know what percentage it increased from. No, but at the very least, that suggests that some of the traffic simply moved from Latvia and Estonia to Lithuania. And of Mm. course, the problem with percentages, Ray, is it doesn't always give you the full picture. Uh, Indeed not. Um, Do you want to explain that in a bit more detail, Graham? Well, yes, let's. Um, So let's say that the total inflows in Estonia and Latvia were each a billion euro and the total inflows in Lithuania were two billion euros. And I must emphasise that I am making these figures up and they could be massively removed from reality. Mm. I'm just using them to represent the problem with percentages. Okay, we accept that. Carry on. Okay, so 1% of a billion euro in Estonia and 1% of a billion euro in Latvia is around 20 million, whereas 2.8% of 2 billion in Lithuania is 56 million. So Mm. a large percentage drop in two countries could easily have been offset by a smaller percentage increase in the third. But just to reiterate, we're not saying that actually happened, just that percentages on their own can be tricky and don't tell the whole story. Exactly. And then the executive summary moves on to sanctions, and here I think the news is much better. Even though they identify potential sanctions breaches, Ray? Uh, Yes, Graham. So, how so? Uh, Context, Graham. The investigation looked at nearly 27 million transactions and nearly 2 million US dollar payments. Uh, Within that, Clifford Charles identified 582 transactions, totalling... $4.76 $4.76 million, which gave cause for concern. Within that, the individual amounts are really quite small, and none of them involved 
any directly sanctioned individuals, and all of them were prior to 2017. And I have to say, Graham, I think that that's a record that you can hold up to most of the global banks and not see very much of a difference. I completely agree, Ray. I should think almost any bank that was subjected to that level of granular forensic examination would be found in some respects wanting. Uh, it, it's a, it's a byproduct of the risk based approach that the, that the regulators accept, I believe. Yeah, no, absolutely, and and well, that's a bright spot. <laughs> um, mm. Unlike the governance section of the executive summary, which follows. Well, yeah, that's quite grim, isn't it? <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm quoting: um, Swede Bank senior management historically had failed to establish clear lines of AML responsibilities. And throughout the investigation period, the Swede Bank CEOs appeared to lack an appreciation of the severe risk posed to the institution by the HRNR business. Mm. And you know, Graham, I think in some respects, this is indicative of a problem which started in the 1980s, when the banks first started moving the chair. Uh, um, I'm sorry, Ray? What? Uh, Well... Graham, bear with me. Um, Once upon a time, when you went to your bank, uh, the manager would sit behind a big desk in a big chair and look down at you on the other side of the desk, often in a much smaller chair, Mm. um, and you both knew your place. I remember those days. The manager Mm. represented the bank and and all it stood Mm. for and would decide whether to grant you whatever services Mm -hmm. it is you were requesting. Exactly. The manager was an agent of the bank. Mm. But then, relationship and sales training in the 1980s suggested that the manager should move his chair to the other side of the desk. And the focus then became you and him, because usually it was a him, uh, looking back together towards the bank. Yes, and he, and over time, that also included she, (laughs) became your trusted friend and advisor, and so started the process of customer capture. Mm, Whereby bank employees felt their first duty was towards the bank's customers rather than to the bank itself. The managers effectively became agents of the customer rather than of the bank. Yes, and it's not quite so hard to be strict on, say, lending, Mm -hmm. when the price of poor lending is a forfeit and a loss to the bank. Yeah, although that didn't stop the credit crunch, Graham. No, but it's a lesson I think the bank has learned since. Whereas the price of rigidly enforcing AML controls is to turn away business, business that you get rewarded for and with no appreciable upside. Not to put too fine a point on it, if you reduce credit risk in your organisation, you can often increase the profitability as a byproduct of that. If you reduce the AML risk in your organisation, you will always lose money. Yes. And, And because if you do all of these things properly in the first place, you never get fined, you never get censured, you never see the rewards of doing it properly, which follow from those actions. Mm. Uh, It's almost like you have to go through all this grief first before being able to do it properly. Yeah, now that is a thesis. Mm, But perhaps not for today. True enough. (laughs) So to return to the report, the upside of all of this is that Clifford Chance believed that Swedbank did not make complete and accurate public disclosures of the issues under investigations right through until the investigation itself was commissioned. And that goes right up to the previous CEO and her predecessor. No holding back there. They say, quote, The CEO did not direct sufficient resources, attention or urgency to the remediation of the issues identified and did not ensure that information regarding these issues was shared between relevant Swede Bank control functions or with the management board of the relevant Baltic subsidiaries. Nor did this CEO ensure that the board was adequately educated or apprised of the significant legal and reputational risk that these AML deficiencies present to Swede Bank. And that's a very stark and very explicit piece of condemnatory text, if I may say so, Ray. You may, and it is, Graham. Um, The report also identifies a number of individuals, not named of course, uh, whose action or inaction caused or contributed to the problems in the Baltics, 
as a consequence of which a number of then current employees had their employment terminated. Okay, well, that's fairly clear. So thank you, Ray. Um, Now, clearly, we've only had the chance to read the executive summary in detail rather than the full 200 plus page of the report, which we Mm -hmm. are planning to do over the next few days. Yes, and if having done so, we feel there is more to add, uh, we'll do a follow-up in uh, in another podcast at the first opportunity. Yes, and we'll also include, if we can, any of the fallout from this report. Uh, But in the meantime, Ray, we will return to our original plan, and the next episode will now be a review of the European Banking Federation's recent report into dirty money flows in the European Union. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Dark Money Files. We hope you enjoyed it. If you would like to listen to future episodes, please subscribe through iTunes, Spotify or your normal podcast provider. Thanks.